Okay, I think we might just get started. It's fabulous to have you all here. Uh, my name is Michelle Ryan. I'm the director of the Global Institute for Women's Leadership here at ANU. Uh, we've got a three-pronged attack at the Global Institute for Women's Leadership. We call ourselves DUAL. Um, so when it comes to gender equality, we do research, world-leading research, and a few of our researchers are here in the audience as well. Uh, we translate that research into policy, and we also do advocacy, such as the events that we've got here today. So I'm not going to speak too much. I'd just like to start with a welcome to country and a, and a quick introduction of, of um, our panel, um, and then I will, will pass over. But I'd like to begin this event by acknowledging the traditional custodians of this land on which we meet today, which is the Ngunnawal and the Ngambri people, and I'd like to pay my respects to their elders past and present. I'd also like to ex extend that um, respect to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders here in the room today. I'd also like to acknowledge that this land was never ceded, and it always was and always will be Aboriginal land. So, without further ado, I would like to introduce our facilitator today um, and welcome Georgie Dent. Um, she will be facilitating the questions, getting us going. Uh, Georgie is a writer, a commentator, a mother of three, and she's a passionate advocate for women and for families. She's a former lawyer, a contributing editor at Women's Agenda, and she's a best-selling author of Breaking Badly, a memoir that was published in 2019. Um, after a year of serving on the board at The Parenthood, uh, Georgie took on the role of Executive Director in July. Welcome, Georgie. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much um, for that introduction. Um, I do have to just warn you, if you walked in and saw the sign about the comedy, this the comedy <laughs> festival, you are in the wrong place. <laughs> I can't deliver comedy. <laughs> unfortunately. Um, I would also like to pay my respects to the traditional owners of the land and I would also like to say that I hope that later this year when we have an opportunity to consider an incredibly generous invitation that was extended to all Australians by First Nations Australians that I think we should accept it um, enthusiastically. Um, I am, before I introduce our panellists, who I know don't actually need an introduction because you know who they are, um, I just wanted to give you a little bit of background about The Parenthood, which is the organisation I am fortunate enough to run. We are a not-for-profit advocacy organisation and we represent, at the moment, just over 80,000 parents and carers nationally. Um, I have been in this role since July of 2020, so it'll be three years this July. Um, and our mission at The Parenthood is to make Australia the best place in the world to be a parent. And we are really deliberate about that ambition because we know that it is only when parents and caregivers are supported that children can thrive. So the idea that we can be a country that cares about children um, just doesn't ring true if we're not a country that cares about um, supporting parents and caregivers. And that is really the framing for our policy priorities. Um, so we commissioned a big piece of research. Um, actually, where is Alicia is here who actually worked on the big piece of research at Equity Economics, um, looking at if we wanted to be able to credibly say we want to make Australia the best place in the world to be a parent, what are the policies that we need and what are the sort of practices and supports that make a difference? And that piece of research sort of gave us a blueprint for what changes we need to pursue to make Australia a much better place in the world to be a parent. Um, and notwithstanding the fact that almost every policy impacts parents and caregivers in some ways, in a really specific sense, we know that having um, a, a, high, a high standard of health care is absolutely critical. Um, but apart from that, we need adequate and equitable paid parental leave that supports both parents where there are two parents to engage um, as carers in that first year. We need access to high quality, completely affordable early childhood education and care that is delivered by a properly paid and supported workforce. Um, and parents and carers need access to workplaces that value caring. Um, and have family-friendly um, employment practices. So that is a really short wish list that I'm currently working on. Um, and that's why I'm really thrilled to have the opportunity to facilitate a conversation like this because talking about how parents juggle their caring responsibilities with their paid work um, is something that I'm really passionate about. Um, and I know that we can do a much better job because the reality is that for lots of parents and carers, 
it is incredibly difficult um, to juggle caring responsibilities with paid work. Just today there was some new research out of um, Melbourne University showing the extent to which dads who share the caregiving role are facing <coughs> discrimination in their workplaces. And the, the experience that men are having is mirroring the experience that um, mums have been having in a workplace. And while that is not a good news story, I think the one positive out of that is it makes it really clear that the issue is with the caregiving responsibility and workplace is not accommodating, accommodating that. It's, it's not an issue, which we've known for a long time, about mums making poor decisions about how they manage their time. You know, this is a systemic issue. And the fact that men are facing the same barriers that women do when they are engaging in caregiving, um, I think just solidifies the, the, the case for action and sort of exposing that reality. Um, so that is, you've probably heard more from me than you needed to, and as I said, no comedy. Um, but I'm going to introduce our panellists and then get into a conversation about um, the specific juggle, um, and I think it is fair to say it's a unique juggle, um, of managing parenting and family responsibilities with um, a public political life. Um, so on the panel tonight we have got um, Andrew Lee, who is the Assistant Minister for Competition and Charities, who is a father of three, um, ACT based. We've got Sally Situ, who is um, the member for Reid in Sydney. She is a new MP. Um, and then we've got Elizabeth Lee, who is the leader of the Liberal Party in the ACT. Um, Elizabeth has promised me that she won't be going into Labor tonight. <laughs> I don't know if I promised, but I said I'd try. No, she did. Uh, but if we do have any medical people here, it would be really... <laughs> useful. I know I did ask. <laughs> Elizabeth is due in three weeks and it is her second child. My second child came three weeks early so I'm just, <laughs> I'm on alert. Um, now Elizabeth, I'm going to ask you the first question because my understanding is you are about to go on maternity leave and I think that makes you the first ever leader of a political party in Australia to go on leave. Is that correct? <laughs> Yeah, it's funny because I had someone raise that with me only a couple of weeks ago and um, I sort of was like, oh, is it? I'm, I'm not sure. I hadn't given it much thought. But the closest I think my office was able to find was um, Rebecca White, Tasmanian Labor leader, who was very heavily pregnant in the lead up to the election. And I was actually in Tasmania for their last election. and um, But my understanding was that she stepped down from the leadership after the election loss in Tasmania. So she technically wasn't on Matt Leave as leader, uh, but that's pretty close. I mean, she was, you know, on the campaign trail eight months pregnant. Um, that's pretty close. So um, that's the closest. But yeah, so uh, might be technically the first, but um, I'm sure that there have been several blokes, but this is where you start to see the difference, isn't it, that you can't tell when they go on any parental leave. Um, I think I was talking to Michelle earlier about, no, Natalie, earlier about maybe Don Perrette went on two weeks parental leave recently, um, but certainly not that, you know, longer maternity leave. No, I mean, but even that, him taking those two weeks and being visible about it was actually um, sort of progress in a way. I mean, we've got a long way to go in terms of what we expect. But I'm interested to know, did you face or feel any pressure being in a leadership position about needing to step down or wanting to step down or talk us through how you have sort of juggled that? Yeah, it's an interesting one. And um, I have to say that uh, um, from my colleagues, certainly no, there was no issues whatsoever. There was not even a question about it. Uh, and. Um, I told my, um, I suppose, colleagues from other parties as well, and uh, uh, there was no issues in that regard either. Um, so we have in our standing orders in our parliament um, 18 weeks of uh, maternity leave, which is just part of um, our standing orders. But prior to that, it was sort of done on a seek advice basis, you know, seek a bit of permission, uh, seek leave, um, and get a pair, uh, so it was not a given. Not that I could imagine anyone would ever oppose it, but um, it wasn't actually a given, but that changed last term. And I think uh, when I went on mat leave with my first daughter, who was born in June 2019, I was the first MLA to actually use that standing order as well. So that was just a given. Um, I Mia was four weeks early, so she, I ended up not having 
given notice and I remember my staff member getting very panicked when I was in the hospital over the weekend going, but we haven't given the speaker notice. <laughs> so I said, it's okay, I'm sure she'll understand. Um, but we have that period now. On saying that, personally, did I have doubts? Of course. One of the first things that I thought about was how do I do this? And, you know, um, like any new parent will testify, it's a very special time that you never get back. And that mum guilt really started to set in. And so I did question myself internally about do I try and stick this out, come back in, you know, sort of four, five, six weeks, or uh, do I need to actually go, you know what, I need to prioritise my family. Um, and I think that if I had even an iota of um, doubt from my colleagues, that may have sort of steamrolled. Mm. But because I had so much support, it just didn't seem to be even a question. Mm. Sally, um, we know that – well, I'm interested to ask you, you're, you have – you are new – into federal politics and you were also a parent. How did you sort of approach, how did being a parent influence, if at all, your decision to run and and, and sort of make this decision? Um, I don't think I would have run had I not been a parent. So I've always been involved or interested in politics and uh, I was a staffer in federal parliament about 15 years ago uh, so I've always had an interest, and um, the Labor Party. Uh, I share very, I, sh I share the values of the party, and that's why I joined. Um, but n never did I have that um, compulsion to run. Um, never did I see myself um, being a member of Parliament. Uh, but it wasn't until I had my child that I realised that there are certain things that I want to make sure he has in his life and that I need to be part of um, pushing for those things. So uh, the two things that really drove me was to um, support education in all its forms. So, um, Georgie, I follow your work very closely because for me I think our concept of education really ought to start from birth and progress right through to mm. university. Um, and that's something that I've um, really believed in. And I, I, I saw the benefits of that in my own son. You know, his language just improved dramatically as soon as he started childcare. Um, so that was really important to me. But also acting on climate change was a big driver for me. And um, it was really thinking about the sort of world that he was going to inherit that drove me to put my hand up to run for my seat. And when I was first thinking about running for the seat of Reed, most of the people who told me who I sought advice from said that, look, you're not going to win it in the first term. This is going to be a two-term strategy, but you should give it a good go. And that, that really is what I thought was going to happen. Um, and I thought, I really do need to give it a good go because we do need to change the government. And I don't think I would have done that had I not had my son. Yeah, that is. It's. I think that's a really interesting perspective, um, Andrew. Look, it's no surprise that usually when we are having conversations about parenting and politics or parenting and any sort of paid work, we have tended to focus really on mums. Um, I'm interested. Have you ever really have you have you faced questions about how you sort of juggle and manage your family responsibilities with your parliamentary um, responsibilities? Uh, well, Georgie, firstly, I should say it's a privilege to be part of the conversation. I would be very happy just sitting here and listening to everyone else talk. So thank you. Thank you for making me a part of it. Uh, I, uh, my youngest kids were, sorry, my eldest kids were three and one when I entered Parliament. They're now 16, 13 and 10. And so basically the boys have never known anything other than politics. Um, being a representative from Canberra does mean you get a kind of living over the shop uh, aspect to your work-life balance that certainly Sally doesn't get and particularly my colleagues from Western Australia don't get. Mm. But politics still kind of seeps into, into everyday life a lot. Uh, I try and deal with it by bringing the boys along to everything, which uh, means that you get 
moments like uh, attending a branch meeting with a son in a Spider-Man costume um, who suddenly, just as you're about to stand up and give your branch report, tugs your arm and says, Dad, I really need to go to the toilet. Uh, and uh, it, it, we... Uh, we had a family photo in 2016 where uh, my eldest son, unbeknownst to us, uh, sorry, youngest son, three, then three, decided that he would wander off to the side and sit looking grumpily uh, on a little uh, little pot. And the photographer, David Foote, managed to capture this shot of the rest of the family smiling happily at the uh, cameraman while Zachary scowled his best scowl. Um, and when I saw the photo, I thought, oh, that's kind of cute, but I don't think we'd put it out. And uh, it was my wife, Gwyneth, who said, no, it's probably worth putting out because people don't want to see this super polished image. Uh, everyone else quite likes the idea that our family is going through the same juggles with work and family as, uh, as they are. Yeah, I think the scowl is... Oh, certainly in our house, our youngest daughter has mastered the scowl in a way no one else has. And uh, so I can relate to that dynamic. Um, I'm interested, we have obviously seen, um, I mean, I'm thinking at the moment of um, Kelly O'Dwyer, we have seen a number of politicians step down from their positions at different, at different moments and really have cited their family responsibility as the reason for that. Is that something that you can sort of see and understand in, in federal parliament? And do you think that there's work being done that can change that equation? Uh, absolutely. You know, one of the problems with I'm stepping down to spend more time with the fa my family is that in some cases it is just an excuse, but in many cases it is absolutely real. And I know friends who have just been delighted by wrapping up a parliamentary career earlier than many in the outside world would have expected and getting to then throw the, throw, throw, have that extra time with family. Um, you know, the line goes, if you're a marginal seat holder or a minister, then you've lost Saturday. If you're a cabinet minister, you've lost Sunday. Uh, so it really is a, a job that intrudes on absolutely everything. Uh, and where, you know, if you're... Uh, it, it's often very hard to combine it. One of the great things that Tony Burke has done in the latest parliament is said that after 6.30pm there cannot be votes. Um, that's the reason that Sally and I are with you now. It's also the reason why after this I'll be off uh, uh, getting our three boys back out from in front of the TV where they're currently sitting while Gwyneth is off at her Pilates class uh, and the reason why on a typical sittings night in many cases I can I can be home with the kids uh, reading them stories putting them to bed uh, in a way in which it just wouldn't have been possible in the parliament I first joined where we sat until 10 p.m. Mm. Elizabeth there is lots of evidence around about the sort of importance of family-friendly work practices to attracting and retaining talent in virtually any workplace. Um, do you think that the same goes for politics and do you think that there are opportunities to ensure that we can sort of attract um, a broader demography and sort of more women into politics? I think definitely. And um, if you have a look at the makeup of the ACT Legislative Assembly compared to uh, federal parliament, in 2016, uh, we, as across all three parties, um, achieved a uh, first female parliament in Australia. And uh, we repeated that in 2020. And I think, you know, you know, people have always asked me about sort of, especially when all of the hype and media about the toxic work culture in federal parliament was around, um, I got asked about a comparison to ACT. And I have to say that there are two main factors that I think have set us apart. One is that we don't have the fly-in, fly-out you know, a mode of uh, meeting. So we're, we're a very small, geographically very small jurisdiction. And so we absolutely have no need to sit until 10 or 1 in the morning. If we need to, we can actually come back the next day. It's different, you know, when you've got colleagues having to fly in from WA. So we don't have that. And the second is, I have to say, that having more women does put a different perspective into what is acceptable. And having had women in leadership roles, so we've had Kay Carnell as the first Liberal female Chief Minister, and we've had you know Katie Gallagher more recently uh, in, 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 as Chief Minister as well. And so there are 
accepted practices in the ACT, which seem like, hold on, isn't that sort of common practice? But in federal parliament probably would be like, whoa, 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 what's going on? So things like um, we rarely sit past 6 p.m., rarely, if that. And uh, so we do also have the luxury of being able to get home most of the time. Uh, and number two, we try to avoid school holidays when it comes to sittings or a lot of committee work. Um, and so that does make a difference. And if we want to attract more women to politics, and if we want to attract more dads who feel they can still have that, then it's, I think, a given. Um, it's interesting, though, that point about sort of men being discriminated against. And my partner at the moment, he is actually in a workplace that has very generous parental leave, like more than what I get. Mm. And when I said to him, oh, that's great, he goes, whoa, 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 I don't know if I can take it all. And I said, what do you mean? And he was worried about, well, what's that going to do for my career? And I just went, mate, welcome to what women have been <laughs> worried about for decades. But it was really interesting, the perspective, because the first thing he thought about was, oh, I don't know if I can take 26 weeks. No way, because, you know, that's going to um, hamper my career prospects. And I just sort of thought that's just such a switch that men had, many men hadn't really thought about. So interesting. Yeah, and look, that's something that we um, talk about quite a bit, that it's one thing to have a policy. And they're actually, like law firms, for example, have had really generous paid parental leave policies for a long time that men and women can access. But if you don't have a culture where using it is acceptable, mm -hmm. then the policy isn't worth, um, isn't worth anything. And I think it is, I think your husband's response is not uncommon. Mm -hmm. um, sorry, your partner's response mm -hmm. is not uncommon. Mm -hmm. um, Sally, earlier in February, you shared on social media that your um, son had had a particularly sort of teary morning um, and he was sad that you were here. Um, it happened to be the same day that I had had an incredibly emotional drop off mm -hmm. with my youngest who just started in a new class and didn't have her friends and she was absolutely distraught and it completely caught me off guard. Um, she, it was her second year of school, mm -hmm. I thought we were okay. Mm -hmm. And I came away and I honestly, holding back tears myself was a huge achievement. I cried as soon as I left the school gates. Um, and it was the same day that you shared your experience. Um, and I shared mine too and I just said, the reality for so many working parents is on any given day you have got a bruised heart mm. or a distracted mind mm. by virtue of these little people that you love out in the world. Tell us about how you and your family are, are managing him and his emotions and you being away? Well, I, I talked about this with um, the Minister for Social Services, Amanda Rishworth, who is uh, formerly a, a psychologist, and we all said, we both said to each other, we're just building resilience in them. We're doing great. <laughs> um, so there is, uh, there is part of that. But um, I think for, for our family, um, we understand that it's not just about my husband and I. Um, we're very fortunate that um, we've got our own little village to support us. Um, we've got both sets of grandparents who are willing and desperately wanting to step in to assist and help. And um, my brother who lives very close by. So my niece is always helping us with babysitting. Um, so we're very fortunate in that sense and actually um, I used to work in Samoa with Ausaid and seeing how um, that culture parents is dramatically different from how we do it here. Um, they all live in one big property together and it's multi-generational and the aunts and uncles and mums and dads and grandmas, they're all in each other's business and looking after each other's kids and, you know, I don't necessarily want to go down that route, but I do admire a lot of what they're able to achieve as a result. And so I think we're, my husband and I have both given up on the idea that it's only going to be the two of us who parent my child. And he, I think, is um, lucky for it um, that he has so many great influences in his life. Um, but I have kind of... Um, flipped my thinking around it as well. So, yes, it is hard and, yes, I do spend a lot of time away from my family, um, but there are some extraordinary things 
um, that my role has given my son. So uh, if I just share one anecdote, uh, he came home from school one day and said to me, Mummy, Mummy, I think people said you're really kind. And I was like, what do you, what do you mean? He said, um, Elizabeth from Year 2 came up to me in the playground and she asked if my mummy was Sally Situ, and I said, yes. And she said, your mummy's really kind. And I said, why? And she said, because she's always trying to help people. And so for me, I think that was a lovely example of um, showing him the type of um, person that I'd like him to be and the values that I think um, we as a family would like to have, and that is the idea of helping others and service. And so he sees me doing that directly. Sometimes he's standing beside me at a really boring branch meeting and hearing me talk about the things that we do. But he's seeing it instead of me and my husband telling him about those values. He sees it and he, he kind of lives it through me. And so... I get that there are some hard things about this role, but I think that I am also enriching his life in a way that I wouldn't have had the opportunity to had I not been in this role. Yeah, I think that's an amazing sort of perspective. It's not a zero-sum game at all. Um, I am really conscious of the fact that as men and women, we are um, sort of culturally indoctrinated about our role and... We do, um, I know that um, one of the things, if I ever want my husband to roll his eyes at me, I will tell him all the things I'm feeling guilty about on any particular day about our children. <laughs> and he's just like, I honestly don't know how you get out of bed. <laughs> um, but instead of beating myself up about that, I say to him, as a, as a woman, the sort of public expectations that I have absorbed are really, you know, women as caregivers. And so then when you do get a huge amount of purpose and out of your professional life, I, I find myself confronting this and I have to have those conversations with myself all the time about actually our girls are enriched by having a mum who is engaged professionally um, and the, the sort of double standard in my head about what I'm doing compared to my husband. And Andrew, I'm gonna put you on the spot in this regard because I'm interested to know do you watch your sort of female colleagues in Parliament and think that for them the reality of juggling caregiving responsibilities is different to, to y you as a sort of um, dad or, and your male peers? Yeah, absolutely. I did a book called The Luck of Politics back in 2015 and I was interested in a little quirky exercise about whether Liberal or Labor politicians had more boys or girls. Um, and in the process of doing that, I ended up counting the number of kids that male and female politicians had. And it turned out that female politicians, as of 2015, had on average one fewer, ch uh, one fewer children than male politicians. Um, I gave the numbers to Annabel Crabb, who used them in the wife drought. Um, but it did speak very strongly to the challenge of uh, having, having kids and being a woman in politics. But there's, it's just amazing seeing colleagues leaning into it. So it's uh, multiple birth week this week and uh, my colleague Annika Wells has decided because uh, she's moving house that she will uh, leave her husband without the kids this week and she'll bring them down to Canberra. So she came down with her twins and she brought one of the twins along to a uh, caucus committee meeting at uh, noon today. So her son was uh, happily bubbling around. And then she did an interview in the courtyard with Greg Jennett. Um, and she said the thing that struck her was she told the ABC beforehand that she was going to bring her twins along uh, and they brought along a play blanket and some toys <laughs> and a packet of biscuits. And she was just... She was impressed not only that they said yes, but that they leaned into the event. Um, Annika's brought, uh, her, when the twins were much younger, she brought the pram into Parliament for a division. Uh, I remember seeing her when the bells were ringing and she said, I don't know if I can bring a pram into the Parliament. 
I was like, Annika, let's take it in and let's let let them try and stop you from coming in to vote with a pram with two sleeping twins inside. Um, so it is it's it's truly lovely having kids in pan caucus committees. I love it when a kid cries during question time. <laughs> uh, just just reminds you of the kind of basic humanity of the place. Mm. You know, having kids makes the world seem a little bit sillier, a little bit gentler. It's a little bit harder to to take everything too seriously. Um, so. So whether you're whether you're a dad or a mum, I think there's there's a great benefit to involving the kids in things. I've been burnt with it before. Can I give you one one quick story? I took um, one of our kids along to the tarmac where I had to meet um, Prince Charles and uh, and Camilla who were coming coming in. And it was a Sunday. I didn't want to spend time away from the kids. And so I just said to my eldest, do you want to come along with me? So we picked up some flowers. We went, went in. He gave the uh, flowers to, uh, to, to Camilla. We did the usual handshake. And there was a journalist there who said, um, do you mind if I have a chat with your, uh, with your son? And I had to go and do something else. And I was like, you know, what on earth could, could happen with this? That'll be fine. Just leave the, leave the, leave the child with the journalist to chat. <laughs> Next day, the report of the story in the Canberra Times begins, the flowers were from Woolworths, but the smile was from the heart. <laughs> so at least, at least Sebastian came out well from the story. Oh, I love it. Now, look, because you did bring up multiple births, um, I do want to flag that um, today at Parliament House there was an event um, that the Australian Multiple Births Association ran and they had 12 families travel to Canberra. Um, I mean, frankly, even if you lived 100 metres from Parliament House, bringing twins or triplets mm. to Parliament House by 9.30 mm. this morning, and they had 12 families who all paid their own way to be there wow. today to launch a piece of research called Multiples Matter. And, it took, you know, the director, um, Celia Anderson-Cook, has triplets who are just over one, and seven months ago, when she was realising the extent to which parents of multiples just don't get the support they need, she imagined hosting an event in Parliament House, um, which she did today. And it was... Um, Annika was there. There were a number of... Jed Kearney, who has, is also a mum of twins. Dr Monique Ryan, who is a twin, was there. Um, it was really well um, attended. And they, the research is really... Um, it makes a very compelling case for why... I mean, we all know it that if you have more than one baby, you're going to need more support than a person who just has one baby and um, the support isn't necessarily there for them and they're carrying an incredible load. So just because you brought it up, I had to give them a plug. Um, I also was meant to say at the very beginning that if you have questions, I will come to you. So I didn't tell you that, but please do think about um, any questions because we would love to have you um, ask the panellists your thoughts on, on how they're managing um, their political careers and public life. Actually, that is something that I wanted to ask. Um, I, ABC Canberra did a radio interview with me this afternoon and they were interested to know, and I said I would ask you each of you this, to what extent are you aware of the sort of public um, nature of your role in relation to your children? Like, how, how do you juggle? Uh, and Because what I keep thinking about is, Lord knows the wild tantrums that I have been, you know, you know, when you take kids to the supermarket or something. And I have often thought, if you were a position, if you were a public person and that happened, it would be terrifying. Is that something you are aware of as a parent, particularly of, and I'm looking at you, Elizabeth, only because I know your children are younger. Is that something that you carry with you? Um, I think that's a bit of a yes and no question uh, because when, you know, I'm doing something on the weekend and I've got my three-year-old and uh, God knows three-nager, it is, it is terrifying. Um, but you want to be present with them, right? So you don't want to be sort of continuously looking over your shoulder or thinking about, you know, is anyone sort of watching? But God, I mean, the same could be said for, you know, you've got to be careful that, I'm no, I don't know, going down to the shops with stretchy pants and no makeup on or, um, you know, uh, heaven forbid, <laughs> picking something out of your teeth in the car and someone sees you you know just stuff like that so I think that there is there is on the in the back of your mind but certainly I don't let that rule my life if you know what I mean so um, one part of me is like when I'm with my daughter um, I just want to be mum you know to her like 
to 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 my daughter, I'm just mum, right? It's not. Um, it's not. Uh, I mean, you know, she'll definitely when someone says something, she'll say it's Elizabeth. It's Elizabeth Lee. <laughs> she she knows that much, but that's it. I'm just mum. So um, you know, I, I just have to be careful because at the moment she's uh, learning body parts and um, knowing how to make comments about body parts. So just got to be careful that she doesn't sort of um, talk about penises and vaginas out in public. Um, <laughs> but at the same time, I don't want to discourage her from you know. Using the 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 the, the cr correct an, uh, anatomical terms, so um, but I think that anyone who's had children understands. Like I, I think that most people are not going to turn around and go, oh God, you know, Elizabeth's daughter like lost it in the and had a tantrum in the supermarket. I think they'll I think they'll get that. Um, so I'm not too worried about it, but it's sort of something in the back of my mind. Yeah, I'm glad you're in the position you are because I feel like there are some people w that it might be too hard but maybe I'm just a weird person um, but I think that's probably the right approach to take what about you Sally well I've, um, I um I think potentially because my my son is out of his big tantrum phases because we did have some real moments and and then also when he was toilet training as well so um thankfully I kind of got into this after those two awful periods <laughs> Um, but we've we've actually had very um, positive experiences. So I'll, I'll give you two examples. So there was um, one night I was out with um, the family and we were at Korean barbecue and Korean barbecue can be quite a messy affair. You're dipping in the sauces. And I um, heard someone call my name from the table over and I looked over and it was... Um, an, a an Asian woman, and um, and I didn't recognise her, and she said, you don't know who I am, but I just wanted to say, I'm so proud of you, you give, and then she points at her daughter, she says, you give her someone to look up to, and I was like, oh, that was really lovely. Um, and then my son asked me about it, mummy, do you know that lady, why do you, and, and then I had to explain to him it's because, you know, she thinks it's really great that mummy ran, and, and so he kind of had that really positive experience. And then um, we had another moment where um, I was out at a St. Patrick's Day um, fete, and I was with him, and he was being a bit, a little bit difficult, like refused to sit in his own seat, had to sit on my lap, and so we were trying to eat and I was like awkwardly bending around him. And this older gentleman came and tapped me on the shoulder and I, I was thinking to myself, oh, he wants us to move or we're making too much noise. And he actually said to me, um, I read your tweet and I, and I, was, <laughs> I was astounded, but he said, I read your tweet and I think it's great that you're here with your son spending time together. Good on you. I won't take up too much of your time together, but I just wanted to let you know that. And I thought that was really lovely. Yeah, yeah there are some good humans there out there, are, aren't there? Yeah. Even on Twitter, there are good humans. <laughs> yeah. Hard to jump yes. <laughs> Even on Twitter, it is true. Um, actually, there's a few people in this room that I only know. I've only known because of Twitter. <laughs> it does actually connect you to some great people. Um, now, does anybody in the audience have a question for any of our panellists? And I'll be really disappointed if someone doesn't put their hand up. <laughs> uh, one here and then Kim. Uh, thank you. Uh, to what extent do you think it's about personal action and standing up and saying, I need to take this time or I need these... Uh, changes, and to what extent do you think it's about banding together and making change as a collective? In most big changes, systemic, right? You want to make sure that you have more women in parliament. So we have, for the first time now, a party room which is majority women, and that just completely transforms the conversation. Uh, and the standing orders are changing and that matters too. But I think there's also a bit of a demonstration effect. A good friend of mine is a partner at a Sydney law firm 
and he talks about the importance of noisy exits. So he and his partners have discussed, law partners that is, have discussed when they're going off to pick up kids in the middle of the afternoon, they don't just slink out of the office, leaving their jacket on the back of the chair. They say very noisily, I'm off to pick up the kids now. You can get me on the, on the phone if you need me. Which is sending a signal that that's a perfectly appropriate way for, for others in the, in the uh, organisation to behave. Um, my friend Katie Gallagher says that when she turns down events on the weekend because she has to be with her kids, she makes it a point to never apologise, to never say, I'm sorry, I have to spend time with my kids. Um, I typically fail the Gallagher test, but it is a standard to which I aspire to meet one day. I think it's a bit of both, um, uh, you know, because uh, as Andrew said, the systemic changes do need to come as a collective, but it also takes leadership as well. And uh, the people who are privileged but also have the burden of going first and the being the first of anything no matter what it is 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 hard because there is no pathway uh, um, set for you but I also see it as an opportunity because there is no set stereotype or expectation and and you can sort of um, you know tread that path yourself and um, I think that's really important uh, as well and uh, but it takes a lot of guts I mean it's really difficult sort of being the one that stands up and goes actually I'm going to do this when you know you're you're you you spent your entire adult professional life um, thinking that there's a certain expectation of how you should behave as a professional. Um, you know that sort of old saying about uh, when you're a mum, you, you need to be a mum as if you don't have a career, and when you're working, you need to behave like someone who doesn't have kids. You know, and it's a it's a big um, a pressure, I think, especially on working mums. Uh, but I think we are getting better. We're definitely getting better. And it's that old adage about you can't be what you can't see. So if we normalise having kids, uh, you know, especially with dads around as well, I think that helps enormously. It also means that the next generation of those, you know, girls can see that that's actually a thing that's accepted. And it's not just accepted, but I can actually do that. And it's going to be open to me. So I think it does take both. And and for me, I think it is um, those leaders stepping up to create systemic change. So um, the way I think about diversity in our leadership is that it's not in and of itself enough just to have a diverse looking group of leaders. It's about what you do when you get into those leadership roles. So I look back at the difficult battles that Labor women had in the 90s to push for quotas. And those Labor women, um, they they had to um, bear a lot of the brunt of the arguments and it was not an easy time for them but they pushed and they pushed and they had those debates, which meant that someone like me was then able to pop up in federal parliament some decades later. And then also we were able to create this first majority female federal government in our country's history. And it is because of those leaders who are willing to step up and create the systemic change. I'm interested in the contrast that you've made a couple of times of being a member of parliament in your home state as opposed to those outside of Canberra who have to travel. And it makes me think of what I often tell uh, my constitutional law students, that you can definitely see that there were no women at the drafting of the constitution because of the requirement that our federal parliament had to be at least 100 miles away from Sydney because of the battle between Sydney and Melbourne. And if women had been there, they would have advocated that that would make it very difficult for anyone with family responsibilities. But I'm wondering with the advent of COVID whether there has been an opportunity to be a bit more creative for those of, the, of those members of parliament who are not Canberra based to make it more family friendly, to be more enabling of being a participant without actually having to physically be here in Canberra. So I, I'm, I'm still quite new to it all, so I don't know what it was like before, but certainly um, in some of the committees that I've been on, um, the discussions around, not, not so much the, the Canberra aspect, because um, I think we still need to be here to vote and, and participate in some of the discussions that happen here, but for the committee work, there have been um, some talk around whether or not we can um, hear from people via Zoom. I also think it's beneficial to those who are um, coming to hearings. Like, why do they have to travel to a major city in order to tell us their story or experience? So, 
I think the the Zoom aspect has would be good for me, um, not having to travel, but also good for those wanting to give evidence to a, to a committee. And just to, to add to Sally's comments, uh, Kim, one of the changes that we made to the standing orders this time around picks up the COVID norms of being able to give a speech while you're on parental leave uh, via telepresence. So you can't, as Sally says, you can't be counted for the purpose of a vote or a quorum, uh, but you can make a contribution on parental leave, which tangibly changes your ability to, to work while, while on parental leave. Hi. Um, so just the conversation is just turning some gears in my head, and I'm thinking about a prominent staffer who was heading back to her home city and she wanted to see uh, an event that her stepdaughter, her partner's daughter, was performing at. And there was perhaps a conversation about, you know, de facto parenthood and non-traditional styles of parenthood. Uh, it's already so difficult to have these kind of holistic, inclusive conversations with men. How are we making sure, particularly from a policy dynamic, when we're having conversations about parenthood that we're inclusive of all kinds of parents. Well, again, I think it's about normalising um, the, you know, varied um, uh, family structures that we have in our society. And, um, you know, when you think about, uh, you know, it's only sort of a generation ago that we had these very stereotypical uh, roles for males and females in, in, a, in, a, in a partnership. And that's, that's come a long way. Um, so we still haven't got it perfect, but um, I think it is about normalising it in terms of... And the, and the, and the easiest way to normalise anything, of course, is to um, see it more often, um, you know. So to encourage that kind of behaviour uh, and um, accepting of that publicly, I think, is especially uh, for politicians who do have the privilege of being in that public eye, I think is a really important thing, yeah. Um, and, and increasingly, as you see that there is greater diversity in our parliament, there is diversity in um, the types of families that are there. There are lots of blended families in our, in our caucus and, and, and across the chamber. And I think the, the other important point to make is that um, there are caring responsibilities that we have for our parents and our partners as well. And I think that the greater acceptance of um, parental care responsibilities has also made those other caring responsibi responsibilities um, more acceptable as well. So we will often have um, colleagues who, who, will, who will step away and say, you know, you know, they're a grandparent and they're helping their, their child um, look with the grandchildren or they're looking after, you know, their own parents. And I think that that whole conversation is um, much more present and um, accepted now because it's largely been driven by the um, parental care responsibilities. I would just say that um, in any context... If you don't intentionally include, you will unintentionally exclude. And I think that, um, I mean, at the parenthood, we're really conscious of being intentionally inclusive um, and recognising that parents and carers come in all shapes and sizes. Um, and I would say, you know, one change, and it, this should not be a dramatic shift because single mothers, for example, are very common. That is not a sort of niche um, but because we do have a Prime Minister who was raised by a single mother, we have seen that he has really intentionally included the voices of single mothers at a number of sort of key forums, whether it was the Jobs and Skills Summit at the Early Years Summit on the Women's Economic Equality Task Force. Um, they're really being intentionally included and we need there needs to be investment to follow that. But um, I think, you know, that in itself is something that it's really important to be intentionally inclusive. Hello, um, thank you so much for your discussion so far. It's been really, really good. Um, my question has to do with childcare. Sally, you mentioned earlier how much um, you saw it benefit your own child. And I'm just wondering how we increase that access to more people, in particular people who might be on a lower income or on a single income basis, just to make sure that we're including everyone in that benefit, I guess. Um, well, I'm going to do a big spruik for our um, more affordable um, childcare policy. I think that that's, cr I mean, that's a critical piece to it. 
um, providing a greater childcare subsidy for more families so that they are not having to factor the financial cost of childcare into their decision making as much. So that they, they do have the choice of how many days that they want to go back to work. Um, but I'm going to veer off the Labor Party script a little bit here. What I would really like to see is um, greater competition in the childcare sector. Um, I think that um, unfortunately it has become um, quite a, a sector that's been dominated by um, private providers. Um, my son, in his short time, um, because we moved around a little bit, he actually went to three different childcare centres. Um, one was a not-for-profit, one was a private provider and one was provided by the local council. And our experience, I mean, they were all great centres and he had a fantastic time and great educators, but the local council-run childcare centre was just amazing. It was the most affordable one um, by far. So it was $90 a day um, compared to um, the private provider, which was $140 a day. And integrated in the local community, we went to... He went on excursions to the nursing home, to the library, to the local school... And the childcare workers, the early educators, they had been all been there on average like 10, 15 years. Like they loved the centre. I would really like to see more competition um, in the early education space. Um, and I think that's a, a little bit outside of what the, La the Labor Party is talking about at the moment. But certainly if we improve um, affordability, my thinking is that if we in increase um, competition in the space um, and also um, pay our early educators more and really value the work that they do. Yeah. I was just going to say, I won't delve too much into the policy aspect because it is a federal um, thing, but, um, you know, in Canberra uh, I've engaged with a lot of the early childhood educators and uh, it's interesting because it is the most feminised workforce, um, um, you know, in, in across industries, there's no doubt about it. And uh, when you have a look at history, a lot of the work uh, industry sectors that have been feminised were always lowly paid. And it's interesting because it wasn't that long ago that chefs or cooks or whatever were, were more dominated by females. All of a sudden, all the males come in and, like, they're paid huge amounts, um, you know. So there, I think there is definitely a correlation between a highly feminised workforce and low income. So that's, that's, that's one aspect of things. The second is, of course, uh, making sure that we value the work that the early childhood educators do and... Um, I mean, Mia has been going to the same childcare, uh, early education centre since she was about seven, eight months, and uh, I certainly agree with Sally that you know, in terms of what she learns there, um, it's very interesting because sometimes I go, oh, that's that's new, okay, <laughs> but you know, I can tell what she's learning there, um, but also don't underestimate the value of education that you know, young children get from all around them. And I don't know, perhaps this is more cultural, but Sally referred to it as well, but you know that it takes a village. And I think there is certainly uh, a lot of value that I place in me spending time with my parents. And um, and on Sundays, my, 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 my partner tells me I'm being a tiger mum, but I do send her to Korean language school because it's really important for me that she learns the Korean language. And I know that I can't give her the consistency with language education as much as I try uh, as, uh, as a, you know, um, qualified professional. Um, so um, so I think the education can come in different ways as well. But of course, I say that from a privileged position of someone who can afford it. And so, you know, we need to make sure that everyone has access to, to the benefits because we know how beneficial it is, right? The first thousand days of a child's life, we know how beneficial it is. I, I would also just add there that um, removing the activity test altogether yes would um, really substantially lift access, particularly among lower income households. Um, some research that just came out two weeks ago showed, um, you know, this is a dilemma that anyone who's experienced it can understand, but if you don't have um, an early education place for your child, mm. it's really hard to go to a job interview and it's really hard to get a job. Um, but if you don't have a job, you can't pay for early childhood education and care. And so the activity test acts as a real barrier 
um, for, for a lot of predominantly low-income mothers in particular. Um, so removing the activity test is one thing that um, lots of organisations like the Parenthood have campaigned for. But the other big piece is that there's a Productivity Commission inquiry that is being headed by Deb Brennan. Um, and that really is looking at universal access. How do we design a system that every child, regardless of their postcode, regardless of what their parents earn or don't earn, has got access to high quality early education and care? Um, and under the current subsidy model, it is very impossible to see how you would make that work. So we would be looking at a very different model for delivering early education and care. Um, thank you for that. Um, uh, going on the, with the concepts of privilege and deliberate inclusion um, or active inclusion, I'm wanting to know what um, is in place at the moment to help support mothers or parents from a more diverse background, say for example with children with lived experience of disability or those sorts of messy kind of family lives that we don't tend to see in politics. What's being done within parties and what could or should be done to help support and make room for the, the kind of more average Australian uh, parent to succeed in politics? So once you are paid a parliamentary salary, you're automatically within the top 5% of income earners. So in some sense, you know, you're, you're, you're well up the income scale at that, at that point. Um, but that's not to say you have a whole lot of supports around you. Um, John Howard didn't do a lot of fantastic things during his time in office, but one good thing he did was to take the non-members bar and turn it into a parliamentary early learning centre. Um, for Howard, this was uh, a double benefit. Um, he'd been, uh, it had been pointed out that his government was not particularly family friendly, so he could tick one box there. And the non-members bar was a principal place in which his cabinet ministers would leak to journalists. And so he was able to shut down that source of leakage. But I see it as a challenge particularly for staff. And I'm, you know, one of the things I'm quite conscious of in my office is how we create staffing roles which allow people to combine work and family uh, and bring in those diverse voices. And one of the things we typically have done really badly in politics is to ensure that staffing at the very senior levels is representative. Uh, so if you think about who's staffing the typical Prime Minister's office over the last 30 years, uh, it tends to be people without kids because it is very hard to be a, a, a prime ministerial staffer and have kids. So you get uh, early early 20-somethings, pre-kids, and then you get a cohort of kind of 50, 60-somethings, and then there's this missing middle, uh, which means that the prime minister isn't getting advice from people with uh, complex family backgrounds and who are raising kids at the same time. So there's a, an advice deficit coming through. Uh, I'm trying to do a bit in my own office, and I can see other offices striving towards that, but doing so in an environment which is not conducive to having that diversity of experience. Um, I'm going to say it is a really important and tough question because even running for parliament is a, is a very privileged position. I was able to do that. Um, so essentially um, we went from a two-income household to a one-income household because um, I really couldn't work during the campaign period. Um, but I was able to do that because my husband is a high income earner and we had lived a lifestyle that wasn't beyond our means. And so it meant that um, without my income for, um, it was around eight months, um, we, were able, we were able to do it. That's not the case for many people and, um, you know, it's, maybe a little bit easier in a political party because you have the support structures there to help you. But if we can, if you look at um, the independents, the type of people who were able to run, um, they were, a, and you know, all credit to them, they did an amazing job, but you also had to be able to financially support yourself, um, try to find funding for your campaign and 
all of that means that it does exclude a lot of people. Um, I don't know the answer to your question um, and I think it's something that we need to do better at because um, members of parliament ought to be representative of the community. I think we've done a good job when it comes to gender. I think we're getting better when it comes to cultural diversity. But the other lived experiences that you've talked about, I don't necessarily think we're there yet. Um, so it's st a live question and I, I think um, we as a society, certainly in political parties, is something that we need to um, examine and, and, and get much better at. I think we're certainly not there yet, but you know, in Australia, we're um, we're so much more accessible in terms of uh, political aspirations than some other countries ar around the world, and I think we we, we accept that. Um, it was funny because I was reflecting as as both Andrew and Sally were talking about uh, generation, and the reason I say that is because um, I acknowledge that I'm in a very privileged position, but I grew up with migrant parents. My parents still live in Blacktown in Western Sydney. Their combined income, and, and Dad's 72, he's still working full time um, in a very physical job, and their combined income is about a third of what I earn. They sacrificed so much so that I could have the opportunities that I have. And, and for me, uh, as I was growing up, it wasn't about, oh, I better you know, go and get a part time job and pay them back for all the stuff they did. For me, my biggest repayment to my parents is to succeed because they sacrificed so much that my sisters and I could succeed. And so it got me thinking about the whole generation thing. So there's no way that my parents, and the only thing that sets us apart, because they worked hard, um, you know, they've got the intellectual capacity. The only thing that sets us apart is that I had the opportunity to receive a much higher education here in Australia. You know, that's the only thing that sets us apart. But there is no way that they could have ever even fathomed going into politics in Australia. That just wouldn't have been a reality for them. And certainly for me, growing up as a seven-year-old in Western Sydney, that wasn't a reality either. You know, back when I first moved to Australia and saw um, Bob Hawke, who was the Prime Minister at the time, uh, yelling, you know, across the room at um, some of his... Well, they're all middle-aged white men at that stage. <laughs> it, was, it was 86. It was all middle-aged men. There's no way that a, that a seven-year-old Asian girl, you know, growing up in Western Sydney could have even fathomed that. But, you know, it's less than a generation later and, you know, and I'm, I'm, I'm the first Asian Australian leader of a political, major political party. It's, 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 it's astounding, um, but it's all thanks to a lot of the sacrifices that the previous generation have made. Um, that doesn't resolve the problem of that, but I guess I've brought with me, despite my adulthood being fairly privileged, a lifetime of growing up as a from a, in a childhood where I've seen all of that, and I tell you, my biggest fear as a politician is getting out of touch. I think that's the biggest fear for most politicians. Um, but if I need a dose of reality, I just go home and visit mum and dad. Right? They still live in the same house in Blacktown. They're the kind of people who literally uh, will, you know, shop, go to Aldi, Woolworths, and Coles, and go. All right. The coriander's 89 cents here. Let's get it here. <laughs> you know, they're still in that category. Um, and uh, you know, my dad. <laughs> He still buys the bulk toilet paper and divides it up between my sisters and I <laughs> because he goes, it's cheaper. And I'm like, okay, we can buy our own toilet paper. And then he has this whole, yeah, but, you know, you don't want to lug it upstairs and I'll bring it in. So, so it's that kind of reality that I think is hard to escape, um, you know, despite the fact that I live in a – I have a great income now, you know, and I can certainly provide for my family. But, um, yeah, it's those lived experiences I think are, are pretty important um, as well. Oh, thank you so much um, to the three of you. I have been told we've got a call time. I'm sorry that I know there was one question we didn't get to. Um, but I really, I have found the conversation really fascinating and um, uplifting while also, you know, sobering when, you know, the challenge ahead is immense. It's not an easy juggle. Um, but it's one I think it's critically important that we get right. And I'm really grateful um, to ANU for putting on um, this, creating this forum for this conversation. Thank you all so much for coming here tonight. I hope that you have found the conversation as interesting as I have. Thank you. Thank you.